Okay, so thanks for joining uh, to in this talk, I'm going to talk about coherent structures in, tur in turbulent flows. And before I begin with anything, I like to start with the acknowledgement. So this talk is mostly introduction. Actually, I will try to give an overview of the history of coherent structures and turbulence and so on. But eventually, there will be some original results. And these results were produced by two of my collaborators, Gökhan Yalnız, who is a PhD student at IST Austria, and Elena Marinci uh, is a is um, lecturer in University of Sheffield now. And the calculations we did were done in these two uh, computing clusters in Turkey and Austria. All right, so a very, almost philosophical motivation is what I want to start with. And um, and I will do that over this, you know, uh, conceptual example of a cloud. Okay, so a cloud in this picture, it's a hydrodynamic phenomenon. So it's a result of hydrodynamics, fluid interactions, and so on and so forth. And what we do in computational fluid dynamics is something like this. We pixelize it, okay, so we, have usually have a grid or an effective grid, and then uh, make uh, you know value of the field, specify the value of the field at every grid point, and then we impose um, some local laws of motion like Navier-Stokes equations and so on, and uh, evolve things forward in time. Okay. The very basic, very higher level motivation of my research is to find a a reduced order description of hydrodynamic phenomena where we uh, make use of coherence. By coherence, I mean, uh, we can all, we all agree when we look at a cloud or when we look at this picture, we all agree that there is a cloud there, right? But computational fluid dynamics is never aware of that uh, fact that we agree upon. And the idea is to find a way of incorporating these coherent structures, objects into our theory of hydro hydrodynamics in a way that's something like this. So you wanna call a cloud a cloud, and then details will sort of hopefully will have an uh, idea of how much details were missing. And so the workflow looks like this. So we observe coherence, okay? And coherence implies low dimensionality. Coherence implies that we have a redundant um, <clears throat> information in the system and hopefully in the end we'll develop some basic understanding okay and the objects that we are going to build these ideas are usually called coherent structures in turbulence literature and coherent structures are essentially um, things whoever uh, thinks people see essentially every single person who looked at turbulence in some form uh, observed coherence and they are usually vortices, right? So this is the very early depiction of Leonardo da Vinci, huge vortices uh, as results of the da Vinci's uh, experiments with water. These are the uh, you know famous starry night of uh, Van Gogh, which uh, some people um, analyze the shapes of these vortices and claim that they are actually to, uh, you know in line with the theoretical expectations. Here are a bit more, you know, uh, controlled experiment setting. Again, these are the vortices that is generated uh, behind the cylinders, this is the so-called von Karman vortex tree. And then another more, you know, practically relevant uh, experiment of a turbulent flow here. They, they release some colorful gas and let an airplane go. And around the tip, you see huge vortex forming and a lot of scales and structures and so on. So coherent structures are, you know, in turbulence. And if you're wondering, well, but, you know, how do we actually uh, define them? Where does a vortex start and end? You're asking the right question, okay? So we know that they are there, but um, it is um, not, entirely obvious, how do we actually uh, define them? So, and that's gonna be a big theme of our my talk. And uh, I will uh, tackle this question in the context of so-called wall-bounded shear flows. Okay, so the wall-bounded shear flows are 
uh, you know, what the name suggests, uh, fluid flows bounded by walls and there will be some shear, all right? So the classical examples are uh, this uh, pressure-driven flow between two parallel plates that's called um, plane positive flow or simply channel flow very often, okay? And then the other example is the same geometry, but in this case, in the plane quad flow, there is no net pressure gradient that's uh, driving the flow, but there is a shear that's imposed by the walls. Okay, so the walls are moving in the opposite direction, and uh, in between, there forms the shear. And from shear, as we shall see, we uh, can have turbulence. And the most uh, sort of ubiquitous setting is the, the pipe flow. So wherever you are, there's pipe flow around you. These uh, in between the walls, there are pipes, there are fluids that are flowing in between the pipes. And if you actually uh, try to work out the uh, um, you know, prevalence of pipe flows in our life uh, by measuring how much energy is spent on pumping uh, fluids through pipes, that estimate is about 10% of the global human energy consumption. Okay, so that's a crazy number to think about. But if you think about it, every single heat engine, every single car, every single, uh, you know, even your computers sometimes have uh, um, pipe flows within them. So, so these systems are everywhere and these systems are pipes are of course also the most uh, suitable settings for experimentation. Okay? And uh, in all of the examples that I'm going to consider today, the dynamics will be described by the Navier-Stokes equations, which is this partial differential equation for a velocity field. So U is a three-dimensional vector field in, uh, you know, in, uh, and function of three-dimensional space. And the left-hand side of this equation is simply acceleration. Okay, so we have a partial derivative with respect to time, and then there is this advection term that is the term that's accounting for the actual whole thing is moving, okay? And then on the right-hand side, we have the set of forces, uh, pressure gradient is here, and it's actually, its role is to um, enforce this incompressibility condition, okay? And then usually there's some body force, uh, such as the pressure gradient that's driving this uh, flow, for instance, that can be understood that this is this body force term F, and we have friction, so diffusion term. This is where the energy is dissipated. So, um, and nu is called the kinematic viscosity. Okay, and um, all of these systems, uh, dynamics of all, all of these systems can be described uh, as um, in terms of single non-dimensional control parameter that's called the Reynolds number. And you uh, construct the Reynolds number by finding a velocity scale, this capital U is a velocity scale, it would be this uh, speed of the walls in the plane quet flow, for example. And H is a length scale, okay? So again, here, length scale is the half gap length, for instance, is a good length scale for this system. And you divide by the kinematic viscosity, and you find a non-dimensional number and that tells you how turbulent your flow is. So in all Newtonian fluids uh, um, of the same geometry can be transformed to one another by matching their Reynolds numbers. Okay. Now, let's move on to the coherent structures and uh, in the wall bounded flows and the, um, the first, actually, the uh, one of the first coherent motions that uh, grabbed the attentions of researchers were, were um, so-called near wall streets. Okay, so this is an experimental setup from the Smith and Metzler in 1983, and for some reason, flow goes to, from the right to left. I don't know how did they, why did they do this. Maybe that's how this, uh, how the setup looked like when they walked into the door of the lab. I don't know, but flow goes from right to left. So they have a tank uh, where they, uh, I guess, yeah, they pump water into the tank and then uh, the water is directed into a channel and the channel geometry, I kind of uh, have it here for reference. 
and they have this flow between the parallel plates. And then probably at one point they introduce some distortion or it's the flow is pumped uh, fast enough that the turbulence develops on itself. Okay, what Simit and Metzler then they have a way of visualizing the flow structures uh, by introducing some bubbles into the uh, system and then uh, filming the um, you know shining light and filming how it, how the flow looks like and so they have a camera here that moves with the flow okay and then this is a picture they get so these bright areas here are actually corresponding to uh, fluctuations that are moving slowly so they are moving uh, slower than the uh, mean speed and what they do observe here is that uh, there are these um, filaments of low speed fluid, okay, these uh, white bright spots, and they are approximately 100 wall units apart from one another. So now I have to tell you what wall units are. And um, well, they're basically the appropriate length scales near the wall of a, a wall bounded shear flow. And in the wall bounded shear flow at the wall, uh, the fluid motion is zero. So that's called the no slip boundary condition. With respect to the wall, the fluid uh, doesn't move. And then, so there is no slip at the wall. And then, as a result, of course, then the, at the center of the channel, there is a non zero fluid uh, velocity. So there is a gradient near the wall. You take that gradient, the gradient is uh, sort of velocity per length. So its unit is uh, one over time. And the other uh, quantity with a unit is the uh, viscosity, kinematic viscosity, length square per time. And then using these two quantities, there's only one dimensionless length that you can come up with, and that's this square root of mu over uh, gradient. So that's the appropriate length scale near the wall. And near wall uh, properties of these wall bounded uh, shear flows is, uh, become self-similar if they are measured in these units. Okay, And this experimental discovery was really intriguing because it looked like they repeated their experiment at different Reynolds numbers and then they looked at their data uh, and when they looked at their data in units of the uh, wall, they found that uh, the streaks kind of always there and they're about 100 wall units apart, okay? Now, from this experiment, we go, um, you know, almost 10 years forward and then do injustice to intermediate literature, okay? And uh, come to uh, numerical simulation. So now, in 91, Hinoz and Moin uh, simulated the same system. Okay, now the computers are better and you can actually simulate channel flows, but they're not that good. So you want your domain to be as small as possible. So the, uh, if the simulation domain is small, you have sufficiently low number of degrees of freedom and uh, that costs less. So that's what uh, Jimenez and Moin did. They to start simulating channel flow and they kept making the domain smaller and smaller. And what they found out was really a kind of uh, nice or intriguing surprise. That is, when they make their domains about 100 wall units, uh, smaller than that, uh, shorter than that, uh, sort of uh, span wise extent of the domain, uh, didn't give any turbulence at all. So they found that if the domain is about 100 wall units, they can find turbulence still, or even larger, they can find turbulence. But smaller domains, everything decays, there is no. Uh, fluctuating velocity, and then uh, turbulence cannot be observed anymore. So again, they did repeat this many Reynolds numbers and so on, and this 100 wall units look like the um, sort of typical uh, domain size, typical minimal uh, domain size for turbulence, which they uh, named the minimal flow unit. Okay, Now, this is a shift forward from just an observation, this kind of suggests that, you know, of course that can be a coincidence, but if it's not, this suggests that these streaks are not just there, they have a role, okay? That brings us to the uh, next 
development, uh, very important uh, finding in our field. And that's uh, attributed to Hamilton Kimen Balev. Okay, so Hamilton Kimen Balev uh, looked at slightly different system. Now the plane quest flow I introduced to you earlier on. This one is flow between two parallel plates that are moving in opposite direction. Okay, and they did the essential the same thing as Jimenez and Moyne. They made the domain as small as possible, but on top of that, they also reduced the Reynolds number to a point where you know most people wouldn't even consider that turbulent anymore, but there were still turbulent fluctuations. Okay. And they found um, well, they actually bridged two phenomena. The one is that one was already known at the time, and that is the generation of streaks. So the generation of streaks uh, are actually by the vortices. And the idea is relatively easy to understand because it's a linear process, essentially. The, the, the linear part of the Navier-Stokes equation gives you this. And what it describes is the following. If you have a shear layer like this one here, okay, so if the, there is a, a velocity gradient that gives you shear. And if you put some um, sort of transverse vortices to these, so the, uh, if you um, have vortices that are uh, in the same direction as the shear, so they are, uh, they will uh, carry the slow, let's say, let's focus on this one. This vortex here will carry the slow moving fluid upwards and the uh, fast moving fl fluid downwards. And what it will do is actually generate these modulations of the velocity in the uh, x direction, in the flow direction. So this was actually already known at the time that uh, people knew that the vortices generate streaks and um, by this redis shear redistribution process. What Hamilton Kim and Valef realized that those streaks were unstable. So when you generate these streaks and put them, uh, stack them together, they develop these sinusoidal instability. So here we are looking at uh, velocity isolines at the center of the domain. And uh, the domain is so small that there is only one pair of streaks, actually, one fast and small streak, uh, top and bottom. And they develop this sinusoidal instability like this, and then come back to their uh, initial form. And if you actually do the math and look at the Navier-Stokes equations, triad equations, you find out that uh, this sinusoidal instability uh, brings energy back to the vortices. So that altogether closes the loop. Uh, vortices, streamwise vortices generate streaks, the modulations of the velocity, Streaks undergo an instability, instability uh, through the nonlinear uh, interactions of the Navier Stokes system brings energy back to vortices. Okay, so this is called the self sustaining process, usually now and or uh, sometimes near wall cycle. And um, the problem with that is that it's probably one of the many such things. Okay, so uh, Hamilton, Kamalev, and uh, Kim and Valev showed that uh, streaks and vortices can self-sustain one another through this one interaction, but we are looking at a very, very, very high dimensional system, and uh, there is uh, no reason to believe that this is the only interaction. So this is probably one of the many, uh, and we really don't know what we're neglecting. So the move shift from here to forward comes actually uh, in the subsequent uh, work of the Valet by sort of changing our perspective of how do we think about these uh, coherent structures. And that is illustrated in this picture. Now, this is another simulation, this time uh, actually free shear quit flow, but for the purpose of discussion right now, it's not that important, the de details are not that important. To, so there's a little bit of a difference in the boundary conditions, but this is actually an equilibrium solution. And I will explain what equilibrium solution is later on in more detail. But um, the colors here that are the, these red and blue blobs are the vortices. Okay, so they show you the isosurfaces of the vorticity. So this is probably plus and this is probably minus. So on. And the uh, green surface is the uh, you know, constant velocity surface. 
So these vortices uh, generate streaks, okay? So they're at, uh, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, at the bottom and top half of the domain. And then the streaks underwent uh, instability already, and the vortices are there. So in other words, this picture uh, contains all of the aspects of the self-sustaining process, but not in a dynamic way, because it's an equilibrium solution. And uh, so what it means is that um, this solution don't evolve in time. Okay, It's an exact invariant solution of the Navier-Stokes equation. Because it doesn't evolve in time, it is self-sustaining by definition. Okay, so it's coherent in time uh, and in, in its domain. Um, and it happens to show all the characteristic of the self-sustaining process that Hamilton, Kim, and what I found in identified in 93. So there are categories of invariant solutions, and I'll uh, show them with examples in this slide. So the first one here is called, oh, uh, this is an interesting one because I don't see my, there it is. Okay, so the first invariant solution is an equilibrium solution, and this is actually a video, okay? And nothing changes, and because it's an equilibrium, okay? So it's a waste of time to make this a video, but, you know, uh, pedagogically, there is some value in it. Okay, the next solution is so-called a traveling wave. What a traveling wave does is essentially shifts along the direction of the symmetry. Okay, so now we are looking at, again, some isosurfaces in flow, so the, uh, you know, velocity and vorticity uh, fluctuations, and what they are not, uh, you know, crucially important, but what I'd like you to pay attention to is that nothing changes here. They're just drift, okay? So these are actually, uh, we didn't find this particular solution, but we simulated and create the video. Um, and these are playing quit solutions and they simply, the traveling waves simply drift in the uh, flow direction. Now the next category is so-called periodic orbits and periodic orbits, now they, they have shape changes. Okay, so now in the periodic orbits, there is actual dynamics, things vary in time, you know, the uh, streaks fluctuate, new vortices are generated and so on. But what happens eventually is uh, they come back where they start. So this is the very final frame and this is the first frame, same, okay? So these are closed orbits. And the last uh, type of orbit is what's called the relative periodic orbit. It's this one here in this video, and this video is, unfortunately a bit slow, but once again, uh, you know, the new structures appear as the time evolves, but uh, at the very end, everything is the same up to a shift in space. So um, to see that, perhaps pay attention to these uh, green and purple blobs, okay? And now I'm gonna fast forward to the end. The green is here, purple is here, but actually everything is the same. They just shifted in space. So that's a relative periodic orbit. So these are, um, in other words, sort of broadly speaking, the first two are essentially stationary. They don't have any dynamics. The second two uh, do exhibit dynamics. Okay. Now, the one of the main themes of my research is essentially incorporate these solutions into modeling turbulence. And coherence is there by definition. All right. And that brings me to a new way of thinking about turbulence, and that's called the dynamical systems perspective or dynamical systems approach to turbulence. And in this way of thinking about turbulence is we imagine a turbulent flow, usually in a computational setting, uh, as an infinite dimensional uh, dynamical system. And then uh, we try to understand basically the state space geometry of this system. And you know this should sound abstract, but actually you can uh, build numerical approximations of this system uh, nowadays at relative ease. This video is one of those. Let's see if it's gonna play. Of course not. Let me try to 
play it like this. Okay, so this video uh, on the will have similar visualization in the rest of the talk. On the left hand side, we are looking actually at the projection, okay, from the state space of the system to some uh, two vectors. They probably are um, um, constructed using the symmetries of the system, and this little red dot is uh, synced with the video here. So video is uh, visualizing this three-dimensional uh, vector field that evolves in time. Okay, the system is playing quad flow. And then um, as this little dot evolves for each point in this infinite dimensional state space, we have a snapshot of the field. So it specifies the velocity field at every point. And then the dots here are actually the equilibrium solution of the solutions of the um, plane quet flow. So um, in the next couple of slides, we're going to look at a couple different uh, visualizations of the same system. So here again, uh, the same state space, but from a different uh, on a different projection. Uh, the Black dots here, the scattered black dots are the uh, turbulent uh, data points. And then uh, the equilibrium solutions are kind of at the boundaries of it. Okay, so turbulence uh, appear to be sort of sandwiched between these solutions in these visualizations. And if we bring the periodic orbits into the system, they actually appear where turbulence is. Okay, so um, now qualitative observations. Uh, this is the starting point. So, uh, and this is kind of intuitively um, uh, not so hard to make sense of, you know, equilibrium solutions. What did I say? They don't have in dynamics, but turbulence is dynamic. So uh, for turbulence to be similar to something, it makes more sense for <laughs> that it's similar to periodic orbits. And this suggests that periodic orbits are uh, kind of, uh, where the turbulence is, okay? And how does one actually find these orbits? Because uh, these are unstable objects because turbulence is unstable, it's chaotic. All these invariant solutions are unstable as well. And nowadays, this is a relatively uh, standard method for finding them. We start with a recurrence plot, okay? Now this data is actually comes from uh, my work with Gokhan and uh, the recurrence plot shows you the difference between a velocity field. So these come from simulation and the shifted version of it. Okay, so uh, the, we have a temporal delay by tau and we normalize by the initial state. And then, okay, so uh, we run it for a long simulation. So T is the simulation time, tau is the delay. And when we look at this episode here, we see that there is a minimum, okay? And that minimum uh, suggests that around this time, this turbulent flow is approximately periodic. It's almost coming back to where it's starting. And if I look at the projection of this uh, trajectory onto some vectors in the state space, principal components actually, uh, but yeah, what they are is this is just an illustration. Uh, I see some approximate periodicity. And if I take this data and um, run a Newton solver on it, and this is a sophisticated Newton solver because this is a 100,000 dimensional system, but nevertheless, these methods are well matured at this point. And you run the Newton solver and you find that there's an uh, exactly periodic solution over there, of course, numerically, right? This is no mathematical proof, but and so what these events are uh, called in uh, this literature is a shadowing event. When turbulence comes close to a periodic orbit, um, you see that uh, sort of the properties of the turbulence resembles the, those of the periodic orbit. And also these in, you can see that in the projections like this. So there are a lot of papers who found a lot of uh, periodic orbits in many different turbulent flow simulations. So this is an incomplete list. And what we did um, in this project, now I'm actually coming to our results, ask the question, can we actually use these orbits to describe turbulence? Okay. Can we use these orbits to model turbulence? And another statement of that is, can turbulence be described as a sequence of shadowing events? And as a physicist, of course, 
uh, we like to uh, find the simplest possible systems where we can test our ideas. And in this case, uh, we work in this um, so-called 3D Kolmogorov flow because Kolmogorov flow originally was in 2D. So when it's in three dimensions, we have to specify it. So uh, that is described by these Navier-Stokes equations once again. And now on the right-hand side, I have a sinusoidal forcing term. So this sinusoidal forcing term um, will force the flow uh, in one Fourier mode. And the domain is triply periodic, like this rectangular prism here. And the forcing is depicted by uh, this laminar solution of the solu uh, system. So if the Reynolds number is too sm small, then this is the only solution you get. Velocity field aligns with the forcing, and that's it. But if you have sufficiently high Reynolds number, and this is the, really the minimal almost the, uh, number of Reynolds number where we can see some sort of turbulence, then you can see turbulence. So our domain is periodic in all three dimensions. And we, on top of that, we impose symmetries onto a system that reduces the number of degrees of freedom further, eliminates the continuous symmetries by making sort of left and right and top and bottom of the domain essentially be mappable to one another. Here you can see that the, you know, every purple I have green, every red I have blue then here. So it's a very, very restricted domain, but nevertheless, it takes about, uh, you know, 100,000 grid points to simulate. And here's an example. So the dynamics is chaotic. We're still looking at 3D uh, vector fields. And this is a visualization similar to John Gibson's in the previous slide. We have uh, this little dot moving around and it's synced with this movie here. So as you can see, it's still a, a big mess. Now, um, then what we did, as I described, we found periodic orbits and we began to compare turbulence with the periodic orbits. And um, here is that one video, hopefully it'll play. And um, so this is kind of really hard to watch, but basically um, we have um, two flow visualizations. One is the turbulence, so that's gonna be continuous one. And on the, oops, in the middle is the is going to be different periodic orbits, and then on the right hand side the state space projection of both of them. Okay, and um, as you can see here now, now I pause the video. Uh, the periodic orbit is a closed loop. Turbulence is not a closed loop, but then for a while they will be synchronized. And let's watch and see if we can. Here we go. Now they are in sync, actually, and the videos are more or less uh, indistinguishable. But the periodic orbit is unstable, and turbulence will move on eventually. It has started, okay, and gone. Now there will be another one. Here's a fast one, now we are sync, now the turbulence moved away again. And that will be a third one, I believe. I like this one because they're actually very different for a long time, but then all of a sudden they lock in. For example, I think about now, yeah. very brief and turbulence moves away again. And so these are examples of shadowing in the system. And uh, we, at this stage, I'd like you to make two observations or like we made two observations. One of uh, the first one was that uh, we see these events by inspection, but they are very different from how we found these orbits. To find the orbits, we needed a full recurrence, but full recurrence is rare. But partial recurrence is uh, ubiquitous. Okay? And then uh, at each of these events, sort of intuitively that makes sense, of course, uh, the shapes of these projections, okay, they are similar. And 
Now, this is, a, of course, a shape similarity is essentially a um, qualitative observation. And uh, we decided to make this quantitative. And that's my next step. So um, now this method is uh, the most technical part of this talk. So I'll only sketch what we are doing here. So as I said, it, when we have a shadowing event, and here is an example, okay, we have um, some sort of shape similarity. And the question is, can we find, can we identify shape similarity automatically? And for that, we're going to use uh, topological data analysis. And the method, again, uh, not precisely, goes like this. Um, so we project, oops, oops, everything is moving too fast. Okay, we start by, uh, again, computing projections visualized like this, but they're actually in uh, 30 or more dimensions. They are uh, high dimensional projections from the 100,000 dimensional state space. Okay, and then uh, we sample them kind of coarsely, and then we let these points grow fat. Okay, we, uh, we take these samples and then we turn them into spheres. And as these spheres grow, uh, as you can see, the topology of this um, these objects changes. Eventually, all spheres touch one another and you have a loop, a closed loop. And then if you let the spheres grow even bigger, eventually that entire gap in the middle fill gets filled up and loop disappears. So in topological data analysis and specifically persistent homology, one uh, carries out this process called filtration and then notes to change in, uh, takes note of the change in topology and sort of records them into diagrams like this one. Okay, so these diagrams are called persistence diagrams. Here I'm showing two examples, one computed for the turbulence trajectory and the other one computed for the periodic orbit. And the uh, points on this persistence diagrams tell us when topological changes take place, okay? So the one that's easiest to understand is the generation of these holes, okay? Uh, uh, you, at radius about five, we have a hole generated, and at radius about 13, the hole disappeared, okay? And the same goes for the you know, components. You know, when two components touch one another, they just die. When you have initially, initially you have only components and as components touch together, they disappear. So that line corresponds to that one. And now these uh, diagrams encode shape information. And uh, what we gain in this process by encoding these diagrams in this way is actually a way of quantifying it. So you can uh, describe the metric between these pictures okay? and it's scary it's it, it looks you know uh, really hard to uh, understand but what it tells you is that uh, you know take little dot rods take little pieces of lines connect the dots in diagrams and whatever is the longest uh, rod that is the shortest pairing between all the components of the diagrams that's the distance. That's how different those diagrams are. And so this metric now uh, gives us a way of putting a number on shape similarity. And the next thing we define is what we call the shadowing distance. Now, uh, now we begin our data analysis. We run the turbulence simulations. And for each time instance, we compute this shadowing distance, which is based on these bottleneck distance. Uh, this is between diagrams. And the shadowing distance tells us how similar turbulence at time t to the periodic orbit i. And if we look at the time series of this data, with, uh, we found 17 periodic orbits in the system. Not all of them are shown, but we have this uh, long time series where we have eventual 
minima. And if you look at the minima, we find that these are actually the shadowing events. They're actually the shadowing events that I showed you earlier in the video. This is how we found them. But uh, so whenever we saw a minima, we see that the uh, uh, periodic orbits uh, projection and the uh, um, and the turbulence look one another uh, similar to one another. So this uh, is telling us our method seems to be working. Okay, the next thing uh, we do with this is basically now we are uh, beginning our reduced order description by um, assigning periodic orbits to the time evolution. And we call this shadowing decomposition and starts by first you measure the shadowing distances and then you introduce the threshold and then for and then look at your data. Whenever uh, there is a minimum below the threshold, assign that periodic orbit to the time instance. So we start with the pink one here and we advance the time and look for the next minimum. It's here, advance the time, next minimum and so on. And all of that now can be, is now uh, encoded in this diagram. Okay, horizontal axis is still time, and the vertical axis is now an identifier of the orbit. So orbit one, orbit two, orbit three, and so on. And that essentially gives us already a, a Markov chain because uh, now we have transitions between the orbits and the mark, uh, which can then be sort of summed up to a diagram like this. So turbulence evolves and we go around the periodic orbits. And these um, arrows here are actually uh, whether or not a transition is possible between the two periodic orbits. And of course, by doing statistics, we can also infer these probabilities, which is what we did. Now, um, this is all good and well, of course, but uh, it's not clear whether what we have done uh, makes any sense at all, because uh, you know we measure uh similarities get a number probabilities but is this actually a model of the system is this actually describing the system so to test that uh we now look at the observables now the observables on the system we're going to consider are uh, very standard ones i'll start with kinetic energy so it's the integral of the velocity field Power that's input to system, so we have we, we are driving the system, right? So the forcing drives the system, that's here. And then dissipation rate is this uh, entropy integral. And the velocity profile is the, um, uh, yeah, velocity in x direction as a function of y, that is the non-homogeneous direction of the system. Now, I will compute these quantities in two different ways. One is the so-called standard way. I simulate my system, take a time average, okay? So that's one way of computing this uh, quantity. I'll call this a long time average. And the observable is any observable is capital omega. The other way I can compute the same quantity is from my model. And my model is a Markov chain. So a Markov chain has an invariant measure. Invariant measure is the left eigenvector of the trans, uh, transition matrix. Okay, and I can take these weights, and those are actually uh, basically the sizes of these dots here. This uh, picture has those weights for you. So you can see that the weights are not uniform. The periodic orbits are not equally probable to observe. Some of them observe is, are observed more, the others less. Okay, now using those probabilities and uh, uh, weighing them with the period of the periodic orbits and taking the average of the observables over the periodic orbits, I can estimate my these observables as well. And I'll call these, uh, I'll denote this with a little pi uh, as, a, a, um, as a subscript of the average here. So this is my periodic orbit estimate. And just to show you that these quantities are not just like, you know, some small fluctuation around the average, they have a wide range of values, okay? So this is the kinetic energy time series. It's all over the place. So um, these are, this is another way of looking at these observables now. I'm plotting on this uh, left-hand side, the power input versus dissipation. And as uh, the gray dots are the coming from turbulence. And this plot, kinetic energy versus its time derivative. Again, the gray dots are turbulence. 
And if I put the periodic orbits on top of them, again, I have a bunch of closed loops, okay? And they're clear here, actually, and they're all loops everywhere. And if I compute my averages using uh, time averaging and periodic orbit estimate, I find the same numbers up to three digits. Okay, so of course not perfect mean values, but pretty good mean values. Okay, and the same goes for the uh, velocity profile. Okay, so these are the colors are the individual uh, velocity profiles. So the uh, mean velocity is a function of y coordinates. If I take the average of turbulence, that's the black dashed one here. Okay and then uh, do the averaging with the correct weights and so on, I find the same velocity profile using the periodic orbit average. So my summary so far is um, we've shown that turbulence in 3D Kolmogorov flow simulations can be understood as a Markov chain of shadowing events during which the flow can be approximated by a periodic orbit. So that's what I demonstrated. and. This description accurately reproduces the long time averages of the system as sum over periodic orbits. So we have a verification of the model. Okay, of course, the model is not as precise as the numerical simulation. Simulation uh, gives the sort of the ground truth, but the what's gained in the process is an uh, enormous amount of simplification because simulation is 100,000 dimensional. Model has 17 variables, okay? So this is a massive uh, uh, simplification. But the problem with that is um, this is hard. This is really hard. <laughs> Defining periodic orbits is hard. Topological data analysis is hard. And the system that we looked at, even though it's three-dimensional Navier-Stokes, it's still relatively restricted. So in my remaining sort of five to 10 minutes, I'll uh, try to give you a flavor of how do we think forward in this field, or how do I think forward? It's not the entire field, so okay. So, um, and that's kind of an uh, unsurprising next part. That's data driven. Okay, so everything is data driven. So we are also looking at a data driven way of. Uh, thinking in the same direction. And I'm gonna only talk about uh, dynamic mode decomposition today, although uh, in my research, we also look at other uh, more advanced data driven methods, but the dynamic mode decomposition is um, sort of summarized in this picture. What you do in this uh, method is you run an experiment and it's, usually wait behind the sun. This doesn't have to be, but mostly that. Okay, so you run an experiment and you collect data. Okay, so these are the, uh, I guess, vorticity field data. And then you put that data in these uh, data matrices. So now the column vectors here are essentially uh, the entire snapshot. Okay, so the state vector. And then the capital X is your original data. And then X prime is data shifted by some time. Okay, so the later data. So X prime comes after X. And then what you do, you sort of very bravely assume that there could be a linear system that gives you that data. Although, even though you know that, you know, this is a very nonlinear system. Uh, if you assume that it's uh, there might be a linear mapping between these two data matrices, um, you can actually find the best one, okay? And that's essentially the MD. Now you have a capital A matrix. How do you do it? There are some intermediate steps, but basically you approximate your data with a linear system. And once you have linear system, of course you have modes. So these are called the MD modes. And this is these are actual DMD modes for the wake behind the cylinder. And you can also predict future. And it works relatively well if your system has a strong periodicity. Okay. So this is the idea. In the end, you have a model. Model is linear. That's basically mapping x at time k to k plus one. So in summary, finds the best fit linear system to a given set of measurements. 
it cannot capture chaos, okay? So, but it does capture uh, periodic solutions. It is good at capturing periodic dynamics. And that's the uh, property of it is that I'm gonna eventually make use of, but there's a problem with it. And the problem is the symmetries. So symmetries is in physics, we love symmetries and in computation as well. Symmetries makes everything easier from a computational standpoint, but it destroys everything for data-driven methods because if a data set is invariant under a continuous symmetry, POD modes, so these are experimental eigenfunctions, principal components, they have many names, usually, well, so these are PCA modes, okay? And if there's a, a symmetry, continuous symmetry in the data, then there's no point of doing uh, any of that because uh, what you get at the very end is Fourier decomposition. That's a very well-known result uh, by Sirovich. And DMD is not sort of immune to this because before you compute DMD, you have to compute uh, POD. And so uh, this is an example here, the channel flow of simulation. This is a real uh, simulation that we did now, the uh, pressure-driven uh, pause wave flow in the channel. And if you look at the DMD modes of this uh, sort of video here on the left-hand side, what I like, it, so the first of all, mode zero is just completely average, almost completely average in the X direction. Okay, so the direction into the uh, screen. And then, then the dominant DMD mode, so to speak, uh, the one that has the most contribution to the dynamics. Okay, it seems to have some structure, but if you look carefully, these uh, red and purple blobs appear in the imaginary part of the uh, of the DMD mode. And if you take this one, shift by a quarter domain, you get this snapshot on the right-hand side. So this is what Sirovich was talking about. If you have symmetry in the data, in that direction, you just find a Fourier expansion. So all we captured by doing DMD is basically drifts in the data and drifts don't carry any physical information. So this is a waste of time. So to uh, fix this problem, we have a method basically called symmetry reduction that I have been working on since essentially the beginning of my PhD, but we recently adapted this uh, sort of technology to channel flows. And uh, I'll just give a flavor of it. We, again, uh, so without going into details, then the method goes like this. It's not that complicated. There are technical uh, details, but we start by defining templates, okay? So the template is a vector field that's not supposed to be the solution of the Navier-Stokes equation or anything, but uh, it has one special property. It's, it depends on, um, on the X coordinate as the first Fourier mode. So this is cosine of X with appropriate scales, okay? And we take its quarter domain shift that's the sign. And then uh, we, okay, Fy, I'm going to specify, it. No, not in this slide, but Fy we're going to find later. The idea is we now construct a plane using these two uh, templates and its shift. And then we project our data onto this plane. So each data point is actually some, will have some projection. And by construction, because uh, X and Y directions of these planes are basically cosine and sine, if I take one state and then shift it around, I find a circle. And that circle allows me to actually transform to polar coordinates on this um, frame. So the symmetry reduction is essentially fixing the phase of the zero, phase to zero on this plane. And now you have an uh, sort of, um, symmetry invariant is uh, representation of the system and that I denote by this u hat, okay? And uh, finally, F, how do I define, uh, determine this function of y? I do that by making sure that all my states actually do have a projection because if there's no projection, then I don't, I can't do the uh, polar coordinate transformation. So we do an optimization to find Fy. And here is the result. So left-hand side is the simulation. 
right hand side is the symmetry with your dispersion. And it's most obvious in the channel flow case it's because it's no longer drifting. Okay, so the channel flow has a net drift in, of course, in X direction, but the symmetry reduced channel flow does not have that. It's just shape changing. Okay. Now, finally, after this transformation, we can now look at the MD of the system. And I'll have just two examples of these calculations. The first one is this one. Uh, left hand side, I have, I'll have a video of DNS. In the middle, this is going to be an approximation. Now, the approximation is uh, about 10 dimensional. So it's a very uh, low dimensional approximation. And the right hand side, the projection of two trajectories with little dots showing the temp time instances. And as you can see, these projections look like actually a spiraling out trajectory. It's a, a you know, approximate linear dynamics. In this case, it's exactly linear dynamics because the DMD is exactly linear. But even though there's a lot going on in the system, we can find this low dimensional linear uh, approximations to it. So that's what we call symmetry reduced DMD, abbreviated as SRDMD. Okay. And the next example, again, uh, similar DNS, it's approximation and projections. And this time the dynamics look like a periodic. Uh, like dynamics. Let's see if it's going to play. Yeah. And by the way, the Reynolds number now is 2000, which is uh, if you were to look for periodic orbits, you would have a long day okay? or year or more. You know, so these are actually now um, Reynolds numbers that are more or less considered as turbulence in channel flows. And as you can see, we can still find low dimensional approximations to the dynamics transiently. And that's what all of what we look for, okay? So that brings me to my conclusions. In the first part of results, I showed you that weakly turbulent Kolmogorov flow can be described by a sequence of shadowing events. We found periodic orbits. We showed that turbulence can be decomposed to periodic orbits. In the second part, I showed you symmetry reduction and uh, how it makes DMD applicable to the system with continuous symmetries. And then I showed you a couple examples of uh, how DMD can approximate this very complicated system that is very, very high dimension. Thanks a lot for uh, your attention. I will leave references and codes of everything. So the DMD codes are still not out there because the paper is still under review, but the rest of the codes and data you can find on GitHub. Um, and these are the reference papers. Thanks a lot.